Okay, it's recording, so it's nice. Um, and you can share your slides. Yes, so I just need to find a way to do that. Um, but uh, using it so often. Um, Partager du contenu. Do you think is the red button? Yes. I guess everyone we're we're starting um and as soon as the slides come in. Okay, here we go. Voilà. Okay. So this is full I guess I have no feedback, so just tell uh, me. No, we don't you, you, yeah, we don't see you should you well that's actually okay, but there's a button to if you were going into your own um presentation mode instead of this it would be okay i get that um so this is the pdf okay it's we we'll, we'll see it okay okay so we can now start um good morning everyone i will let Vincent speak uh this is my jose uh from um actually a shipwrecked in Montreal, Canada, uh, and uh, I guess we will um, start now. Uh, Vincent, you can go ahead. Yes, I am Vincent Oka, co-chair of this uh, research group, and so this is the interim meeting for this uh, group uh, that replaces the uh, meeting you should have had, have had during ITF 7, one of seven in Vancouver. So welcome, you just to remind you all the goal of this uh, research group is to foster research in network and application layer coding in order to improve uh, network performance. So we are talking about uh, FEC codes, we are talking about network coding, we are talking about protocols may use to uh, network coding scheme. We will also talk about uh, congestion control since there is a clear relationship between uh, coding and congestion control. There will be a, a talk about it uh, later on. This is an ITF, uh, well, sorry, this is an IRTF research group, but we are following the same uh, rules uh, as uh, IETF, which means that uh, whatever concerns the IPR, internet property rights, uh, will be exactly the same. We will have the opportunity to come back on this later on because of the, the problem that you most probably know, each of you. Same uh, privacy and code of conduct as uh, IETF. So you I let, I, let, I let you uh, read them, if not already done. And uh, uh, we have, as IITF, uh, a few differences with respect to IITF uh, groups in the sense that we are not uh, an engineering group, we are not an engineering uh, working group, we are doing uh, uh, more or less research. And uh, the goal is not to develop uh, standards, but to, uh, well, do something useful for the community in general and for IITF in particular. So if you are not familiar with IRTFs, then you are invited to read this uh, very good RFC 7418. Uh, I, we always put some uh, useful links in this uh, slide. So if ever you want to access the uh, GitHub repository, we have the link. Uh, whatever will be presented today afternoon is already on the GitHub uh, repository. It's also uh, officially uploaded to the IETF page. Uh, the meeting upcoming page will give you the link to this uh, virtual meeting, uh, interim meeting uh, stuff. Uh, uh, here's the agenda. So we uh, will be talking a few minutes uh, on for all these uh, introductions uh, part. I will give you a summary of where we are today. Then I will do a quick uh, overview of uh, the cyber disclosure against RFCs 8681 uh, to give you some background. If ever you didn't follow the discussion on the mailing list, if you didn't add a look at the IPR disclosure, uh, I will try to be a very uh, uh, not to go too much into details, not to uh, do uh, statements that could be controversial, uh, just to to put the facts. And then we will have uh, uh, an update on uh, coding and congestion control uh, work from uh, Nicola Kuhn. And uh, I guess we'll have some time to discuss, so do not hesitate if you have uh, 
uh, questions for the group. So let's continue uh, with uh, some news. So um, the, the work on network coding for satellite systems uh, went through several uh, comments and revisions uh, since uh, previous ITF, ITF 106 in November. So we are now at version uh, 11 and uh, we as uh, chairs believe that uh, this uh, document is now mature enough in order to be uh, uh, sent to uh, I, sorry, ISG uh, review. So we uh, in fact, I am the shepherd, so I did the um, uh, status of this document. I put it in the, the data tracker and I sent an email to uh, uh, Colin in order to continue with uh, ISG uh, review. So we are now waiting for Colin feedback on this. So next uh, uh, work is about uh, network coding for CCN and DN. This is uh, somewhat uh, joint work with uh, the ICNRG research group. Uh, once again, uh, so that's the same situation for this document in the sense that uh, it has been, it has been, it went through several uh, updates and uh, we already made many comments on this document. So it went through several revisions. And uh, we believe that uh, we can soon start uh, last call uh, a research group last call for this document. So uh, do not surprise, in the coming days, we'll do that. We'll put ICNRG research group in copy for this uh, last call, of course. Uh, next document coding for quick. We made uh, an update of this document. Uh, for the moment, it's uh, pretty stable. So in fact, we are more or less waiting for uh, uh, next step, which might be to, to go to uh, IETF. So at the moment, there is no, no news on this. Uh, we don't intend to present anything. It's quite uh, close to the previous version, but uh, more will come in the coming uh, weeks or, or months. Uh, the fourth document I mentioned is about Tetris. So this is, uh, uh, well, it, it is uh, an old uh, internet draft in the sense that it, was, it, it went already through several revisions. So then there was this uh, period during which uh, the document uh, disappeared. So uh, Emmanuel Lochin uh, sent a new uh, version of this document. So it's something that uh, at some point of time, I guess, uh, will be, uh, uh, we'll ask the question to the group whether this uh, document uh, would make sense to, to have it as a, a research group item. So this is something that might happen in the coming uh, weeks or months as well. Next slide, number nine. And uh, finally, so we, had, we have this uh, BATS uh, coding scheme for multi op data transport uh, document from uh, China University. Uh, the situation is uh, uh, quite clear for this one. So there, are, there is some uh, IPR uh, behind this work. So Raymond Jung always made it clear whenever he presented uh, updates on this work that there was there were some uh, patents uh, behind the work, so it's not a surprise for us. So now uh, the University of China made uh, an official IPR disclosure for this, so you can have a look at it, uh, no problem. So we made comments to uh, version O2. Uh, in fact, I made comments. I think it's uh, it's in pretty good shape. Uh, and uh, we are waiting for an update of this uh, for this uh, internet draft. Then at some point of time in the coming weeks, uh, maybe when we have this update, uh, it will be time, I think, to ask the group whether we want to have it as a research group item document. So I invite you all to uh, read this document and uh, why not send uh, feedback to authors, to the list. And if you have an opinion on uh, whether you want uh, to uh, have it uh, research group item document, uh, please uh, keep it in mind. We will ask officially in the coming weeks uh, the question to the group. I have answer. Yes, please. Um, if you go back a couple of slides. Yes. Uh, no, not that far. <laughs> I guess. Uh, First it's 
Yeah, possibly that one. I can't remember. Um, so just a, um, a quick comment. I didn't get to the mute button quick enough. Um, so so I, I do have the network coding for satellite systems draft uh, on my list of things to look at. So so that will be, uh, um, I'll be getting some feedback to you on that, uh, hopefully reasonably soon. Um, looking at the coding for quick draft, um, if I remember right, there are two drafts there. Is that right? Um, are they both planning to continue or are they going to merge eventually? Uh, I didn't get which uh, draft are you referring to? The the two coding stuff? The, the coding for quick. Um, if I remember quick, correctly. Okay. Okay. Draft, okay. Yeah. Coding for quick. So the station is the following. So we indeed we have two documents. So one of them is the framework, and the other one is the uh, uh, ILC uh, FX scheme to be used inside this framework. So for the moment, we're in standby mode, I would say. Uh, as I said, we made a small update to this uh, coding for quick. A framework document, but uh, we are waiting a little bit. Uh, in fact, we are waiting also the go to uh, from the quick uh, working group uh, to uh, well, to to maybe to have it uh, uh, in being reviewed by the quick uh, guys, which will be next step. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I think I can add that yes, there are two documents, and like uh, Vincent said. One is the framework, which I think is, you know, how do we want to use FEC inside Quick, and the other one is more like a specific implementation. Um, and for the moment, they're continuing in parallel. Uh, there's we talked about merging them, uh, but we decided not, and because of you know other issues with RLC, as we will see later in this presentation. So for the moment, I think the the framework is is both are very stable actually, but the framework is something that is more like frankly a real informational. This is you know how we can add FEC uh, inside quick uh, with all the um, and and um, Francois has been really really good at, at following all the details that's happening in in the quick protocol. And we had a meeting uh, in January in Google in Cambridge, where we actually did discuss um, some of these aspects. And, and the other one, again, is an implementation. So for the moment, yeah, there's actually, we should have said I, the IDs uh, updated, but yeah, there's two and for the moment we're keeping them uh, separated. Yes, I think it's important to keep them separate so as there could be other FEC schemes to be used in, within this uh, uh, framework. So there is no reason to, to merge them from this point of view. Uh, this is the same approach as uh, the same as the one we may, we did. We followed for the uh, fake frames work. We have this uh, general framework and uh, inside this framework, we instantiate several uh, FEC schemes, or so I one of them, but we can imagine others as well. Ritz Lomond, for instance, or even something simpler. Okay, that, that makes sense. Uh, and as you say, it might make sense to have either a Reed Solomon code or maybe even a, a simple parity code as well. Yeah, exactly. We, we, we haven't, um, if you, well, actually, I know that historically, the, when the first quick uh, came out, uh, there was a, a very simple XOR and it was uh, taken out uh, because XORs are not very um, useful. But um, the but the idea yeah, uh, and the way we designed the protocol and Francois, you can interrupt me anytime uh, was that we have this ID inside the FEC that we will there is this idea that we that the code could be chosen uh, when we start negotiating the, the the quick session, so that the uh, there's no limitation and there's no enforcement of the uh, the type of coding that we're putting. And, and I think, yeah, um, again, Francois was in Boston in January, so we had a lot of time to discuss, and we mentioned the idea of of trying. Uh, other codes, um, you know, the MIT code, Tetris, uh, XORs, or, you know, a simple parity code, a Reed Solomon. And I think part of the, you know, we're a research group and part of the research could be uh, while we have a framework that is acceptable to the IETF, that we continue the research to find 
the performance of, of these different uh, schemes uh, inside this group. So I, I think it's, um, uh, thank you, Francois. Uh, and uh, so that the, yeah, again, it's the FEC frame. We have a framework. We know that we can use and we should use uh, FEC for quick. And then we will have a, a number of different implementations. Uh, some of them open source, some of them protected by IPR that could be um, <clears throat> that could be used uh, inside the um, the framework. Sure, this makes sense. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> So next news is about, uh, about this, uh, those three uh, IFCs that have been published in January this year. Uh, one of them about uh, fake frame extension to sliding window cuts and uh, the next one about uh, this uh, RLC fake scheme we already mentioned. And the third one about this uh, TMT32 pseudo random number generator that is being used with inside the uh, RLC and that could also be used uh, uh, independently for the protocols. So all of them have been published. They were more or less finalized end of uh, November last year, but there were some tooling issues within the uh, IFC editor and the uh, IFC editor didn't manage to, to get them uh, out before January. Well, so that's the reason. And we received an IPR disclosure, as we already mentioned, for the second one, this IFC 8681 about ILC. We'll talk about it later on. Uh, we are planning to, to held a meeting at uh, Madrid uh, in July, but uh, okay, let's uh, let's cross fingers. Uh, uh, so Colin, Colin, I have a question for you, Colin. Um, as the um, as the IAB and the IETF uh, leadership and, and you as IRTF leadership have discussed about what's going to happen to Madrid and maybe if we are going to have it virtual maybe have it a little bit less chaotic than what happened to Vancouver when the decision was made really late and everybody scrambled and that um, if if it is going to be held virtually that we could start planning a bit more uh, this time it's a question uh, sure uh, we've already started having meetings to plan this and there should be an announcement uh, I would expect later this week what the process is going to be to make that decision Okay, because yeah, I, I think, um, yeah, I think we saw the advantages and the disadvantages of the remote, but I think since the decision was made late, um, I think, yeah, it left a, a bit everybody scrambling. So yeah, in a way, uh, thank you. I, I, if it's, I'm always sure people were thinking about it, but. Uh, I, I... I, I, can't, I can't announce the date as yet, but the decision will be made considerably earlier than it was before. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, so this is me again. Do you see my slide? Info on IPR disclosure again, so I see. Yes, it's okay. Yes. okay. Perfect, thank you. So I will make it very brief and I will try to remain as neutral as possible. If uh, I need, first of all, to say that uh, I'm speaking with my chair at, but as a co-author of this uh, IFC, uh, just to remember uh, you, to remind you, sorry, uh, we received for this IFC 8681 uh, two, well, uh, two, 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 two um, disclosures. The first one we received it on uh, December the third uh, last year. It's, it was about four patents, and we received another IPR disclosure quite recently uh, last week on March the twenty sixth, and uh, this one with uh, Marisa Jose as co-inventor. So it was uh, a bit uh, unusual and then. Uh, not very uh, cool uh, situation for her. Uh, she made the uh, statement on the uh, mailing list. Uh, you can have a look at it if you. I don't want to go into details too much. Uh, this is the situation. Also want to remind you uh, the history for this work. So this is something that began in 2015 in our NWCRG 
research group. Uh, at that time, it was a, a problem position document about, uh, well, should we extend a fake frame to add also the ability to use uh, sliding window cuts or not, and why, and uh, what are the pros, the cons, and so and cetera, and what could we do? So it was uh, the initial work, and then in 2007, we decided to uh, move to the TSVWG uh, transport working group of IETF. So we've been working there for almost uh, well, three years. And uh, this work led to uh, three IFCs, as I already mentioned, one for the uh, fake frame to the protocol extension, framework extension, in order to be able to use sliding window codes. It was not the case before, it was restricted to block codes. Uh, so it was required. Then we also specified uh, this uh, ILC fake scheme and uh, for practical uh, reasons, we have been uh, obliged to remove the uh, uh, PRNG specification, so pseudo random number generator specification out of uh, the RLC FX scheme so as to have something independent. So it's the reason why we have this third IC. So they were published in January this year, as I already said. So what we're talking here is only about uh, the second uh, IFC. Uh, so that's the history. Uh, in fact, uh, if uh, we go back in the past. We already mentioned uh, sliding window cuts, uh, well, quite a long time ago, and we have been working on this uh, with, uh, thanks to uh, Emmanuel Locha and colleagues from uh, uh, Toulouse, Isao, at that time. So we published in, uh, well, not published, but we uh, did a record in uh, archive uh, on uh, April 2009, so 11 years ago about uh, Tetris proposal, Tetris protocol, and inside this uh, work, there was already this uh, random linear code that was specified. So just to, to, uh, so just to, to, to make sure that we already, that we all uh, understand that this is not something which is particularly new, a new idea, certainly not. Uh, then this uh, IPR disclosure makes me feel uncomfortable also because uh, the RLC fake scheme that we are talking about here is purely end-to-end. -end. There is no recording capabilities with this uh, FEC scheme. This is purely end-to-end, -end, which means that there is a single encoding point, traditionally the, uh, the sender and the sender, and a single uh, decoding point, traditionally the receiver. Nothing in between. So it's uh, more uh, traditional, uh, it's more like a traditional legacy erasure FEC code. It could be uh, Reed Solomon, it could be a Raptor, it's working more or less the same. So now the codes uh, internals are different, but uh, the general idea, uh, the general way we use this uh, building block is more or less the same. So now let's uh, uh, put my uh, chair hat on. As we always, always remind ITF and IRTF participants, we uh, need to follow the uh, IPR rules in terms of uh, timely IPR disclosure. And it's uh, clear, very clear since the beginning that uh, disclosures must be made uh, in a timely manner, in a period measure in days or weeks, not months. And here we are talking about years. Uh, I, remind, I remind you that uh, we first uh, presented things in uh, 2015 in the uh, NWCRG uh, group. And uh, Coden, who made this, uh, those two IPR disclosures, was there since the beginning of uh, NWCRG. So there's no, uh, it's, there's no ambiguity with respect to, to this uh, requirement to do uh, timely disclosures. And the fact that Coden participants, Coden uh, persons, were aware of this uh, requirement. So that's all I would like to say at the moment. Maybe, Marie-Jo, you want to add something on your side? Uh, yeah, I think it, 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 from at least one uh, person who was uh, sending emails Saturday, it wasn't clear that I was not working for MIT anymore. Uh, and uh, Codon, for those of you who don't know them, or what they call a patent exploitation company, uh, their business is to um, license patents and then 
try to sell on their other hand uh, licenses to company who wants to use this IPR. Um, yes, I worked uh, five years at MIT and while I was there, uh, there were a number of patents that were um, issued um, with me. And the patent that was disclosed was a surprise for me because um, as far as I'm concerned, the work in that patent was not related to RLC at all. Um, I could see actually um, it being disclosed against uh, a more, I would say, system or implementation uh, draft if there was one in the group and the, currently there's none related to that. Um, it, it made me extremely uncomfortable because it, you know, I look at the uh, intellectual property disclosures again as a timely matter. And I've been aware of the work in RLC, obviously, from the beginning. So it made it sound that I was partial uh, to the RLC development against um, the, my duty as a tree, as an inventor, to uh, also uh, respect the, the patent. Um, I would, that's why I made the decision that I sent the email um, to the group. Um, I still do not think that the patent is related to the RLC world, uh, the RLC work. Um, probably the patent owners disagree with me, but that's fine. Uh, however, I think it made me recognize that uh, there was an issue um, about the patent disclosure when, again, the patent have now been um, or not been used by somebody where the, the um, or somebody or a company where the patent inventor is not working there anymore. Um, and I'm sure I'm not the only one. There's an awful lot of people in the IETF and the IRTF who have moved on uh, from you know a job in, in Cisco or a job in, in the old days, Motorola, who is now owned by Google. And we have tons of patents. Like, I think I have 11 inside Motorola. I have some at Nokia from way back when. Um, that, you know, frankly, when you leave, you you kind of forget about them. You know, it's nice for your CV to have this. But I now recognize that um, these patents, uh, since now they're administered by a third party, um, can become a, an issue, I think, especially for us, the chairs, um, when people uh, do disclosures. And uh, again, I think the mo what it... Uh, what it made me also recognize against the timeliness. I think um, I looked back to a lot of the blue sheets that we had uh, for a few years behind and and um, all the work related to RLC was presented at a large number of, um, well, all I think the meetings uh, while the work was being developed and, and even when the RFC was, was issued, but truly while the work was being done from the beginning. And I think if somebody had an issue there, that there was uh, issues of compliance against the patent, uh, there was ample time, timely time to do that. And again, I didn't do it because I didn't feel it was related. So I don't think I have uh, an issue with my own um, implication in this. But I think the the untimeliness of the disclosure, except especially the March 26th, again, made it sound like I had um, not done my duty. And I that's what I felt was an issue. Uh, I think what it let's you know, move on. Uh, it's not necessary to dwell on this for for ages, but I think um, I don't see any representative either of MIT or CODON. Um, on the call right now, but since we're recording, they can actually have access to this. I think it creates this need for reminding the timeliness and uh, maybe also for everybody who makes a disclosure on a patent where they are not the inventor. Maybe professional courtesy could apply to at least warn the people. Uh, 
especially when it creates a semblance of conflict of interest uh, to at least warn the people. By the way, uh, I think your patent applies to this and that, and uh, we're, we intend to disclose it. So either you agree with us or you disagree with us, but you know we at least want to warn you that it ha it's happening. And I think the the appearance of conflict of interest was the thing that really uh, I felt was uh, was difficult. But um, I think again, uh, let's take this as a learning experience. Uh, I don't think a lot of us have ex a lot of experience with patent exploiting companies, um, and uh, we're learning. And um, from the beginning in this research group, there's always been an issue with uh, a lot of patents that had been uh, disclosed, well, not disclosed, but had been filed, especially by MIT and, and then by Codon, uh, about all kinds of aspects of, of the network coding, which is the MIT patent, the, like, um, Vincent said, the, uh, with the recoding uh, in the in the in the uh, in the network. Yes, Colin, you have a question. I think there were several others in the queue before me. Okay. Uh, who have questions? I'm done anyway. So questions. Um, who is in the I queue? Think I, I went into the queue first. Um, I, I would... Hi, Karsten. Hi. I would like to make a couple of comments here. Uh, not because I love to talk about patents, but because I think the network coding research group is susceptible to, to this kind of thing. So it's really important to, to know what, what we are doing. Um, first of all, the, the, the IPR disclosure policy um, of the IATF asks us to disclose patents that we know about that might read on a technology that, that uh, we are working on here. And um, one important observation is the fact that you are listed as an inventor on a patent has absolutely no bearing to what you know about this patent. Because from, from the time when, when the applicant saw, saw a need to list you as an inventor on the, the patent, to the time it's actually granted, the, the patent may have changed in so many ways. Uh, that, that that there cannot be a presumption that inventors reasonably know what's in a patent. I think that, that that's observation number one. And observation number two is, um, I also do not think that inventors who who use a, a kind of logic that is uh, kind of based on mathematics and and technology and so on. Uh, really are good people to make statements about whether a patent would read on some technology or not. And because uh, saying something about this exposes uh, you to some, some uh, legal situations you may not want to be in, um, it's generally not a great idea to, to make statements uh, like uh, patent X does not read on this uh, technology, because in the end you might might uh, might find yourself in a situation where you are liable, uh, because some some court somewhere has a different interpretation of of the words in the patent than than a technologist um, might have. Uh, so uh, this is all all very very difficult, and it's it's really difficult to do the right thing. But I what what I really want to stick is uh, being an inventor on a patent doesn't mean that you know what's in there. And uh, even being an inventor doesn't mean that you can make a qualified statement of what, what uh, technology this patent actually reads on or not. Well, okay, I, before, I, I completely agree with you, uh, but before I, I sent my own, um, um, the patent actually dates back to 2012. And before I, so it hasn't changed since we, submitted it in 2012. So that's one thing. Uh, and before I did anything, I, um, I went back and reread it. So, but I completely agree with you. Uh, it's just that I, I don't know how we can deal with the fact that 
when a third party discloses a patent where an inventor is who is not working for them is also part of the leadership of the working group or the research group um, and creates this, this semblance of conflict of interest that the, the inventor himself or herself uh, did not disclose the patent because, you know, I, I didn't feel that it was related. Um, and people can disagree with me, that's fine, but I don't know if, yeah, I, I think like I said, I, I think it was just, prof I know, I think it was professional courtesy to, to tell, you know, we're going to do that. You may disagree with us, but we're going to do it. And at least I would have been not completely surprised. And the surprise was the problem, not anything else. Uh, Colin, you're in the queue. I, I, I don't think there is a concept of professional courtesy, courtesy towards inventors of patents. Okay. Not, <laughs> not saying that lightly. <laughs> Well, then how do we make sure that I don't have the type of surprise that I had last week and on Saturday morning when somebody called for my resignation? Well, my suggestion is to, to treat that as what it was. Uh, you are listed as an inventor on a patent and the applicant has filed a disclosure that they, leave this, this, uh, that they believe this reads on a document of the research group. And I think that, that only creates a very mild form of relationship. Okay, point taken. Yes, I, I mean, it, if if you don't believe that the you know the, the patent is, is related, then you don't need to file a disclosure. Um, I mean, the, the the rules are, are as, as I understand them, are fairly clear about this. Yeah. Anyway, I, I think it they they put me a little bit of a in a difficult position, but. I think we're okay now. Let's move on. Yeah. So this is the end. So now we are. So um, yes, question. I, I think Lars was in the queue as well. Oh, Lars. Yes. I can't hear you, Lars. We can't hear you, Lars. Let's type it into the chat. Yeah, usually when somebody has the um, a microphone listed, Lars, for the moment, we do not see you as having any uh, audio connectivity. Well, actually, I see him as uh, having audio. He's unmuted. No, he's muted again. Oh, okay, Lars, you're muted now. So unmute yourself and you should be fine. Okay. Well, he was unmuted before, so. Yeah. Okay, um, I, I guess that doesn't matter. Um, so, uh, I mean, as as far as I'm concerned, uh, I, I don't see that there is an issue here. I mean, it, it's uh, I, I agree. It's uh, un unfortunate that the disclosure was was late and that uh, uh, Marie Jose was was not made aware that this was going to happen uh, in advance. Um, but you know, my understanding of the rules is that there is no re requirement to make a disclosure unless you believe the, the patent relates to the work. And if if you don't believe the patent relates, then that's okay. And uh, you know, a, a statement that so, as you made that that you you were uh, you, you didn't believe the patent related to the the the, the draft and the RFC in question is, is sufficient. Um, I'd also like like to remind uh, the group that the disclosures need to be made on making a, a contribution. Um, so if if one just sits at the back of the group and doesn't make any any comments, there's no as, as I understand it, there's no requirement to disclose. But uh, any presentation or discussion um, of, of the work does require a disclosure. Uh, and I'd uh, remind people that, that that is a requirement of participating in the, the IRTF uh, and, and the IETF for that matter. So uh, please do ensure that you make these disclosures in a, in a timely manner. Of course.
Thank you, Colin. I think Lars is trying to reconnect, but when you reconnect, we can come back. It doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's move on with uh, uh, Nicola. Nicola, you have the floor. I can. Yes. J just tell me when you want me to, to move to the next slide. Uh, by the way, Marie Jose, can you keep a record of the because when I'm sharing the PDF, I cannot see what's there. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, um, I think I've seen since we started, um, Dave, Dave Oren and now Hiro Malik are the new two people. So I'm guessing Dave Oren is the ICNRG. Who, who's the idea group? It seems like uh, it automatically logged me in if you have an account for your working with or research group. So sorry, this is yeah, it's Dave. I I, I don't know whether there's a way to log in without doing that. <laughs> sorry, it seems, to, it seems to catch someone out in every call I'm on. But, uh, so con confirming and thanks, Susan, for confirming. Okay, thank you, Nicola. Okay, so hello everyone. Um, so this is a quick update on the coding and congestion control in transport uh, document. Um, Michael could can go to next slide, please. So since um, in the last IETF, so we, so Emmanuel, Francois, Michael, and I um, had lots of uh, discussion. Uh, it was an individual 4.0 document. And now it is a research group document. Um, the version two. So we had some comments on the list from Spencer, who was reported was going was saying. Um, we also had a deep review from Vincent, and there were some questions on wording from Lloyd on the list. So now this is a research book document with the number two, um, and I think that because a lot of things changed since the first version, um, I, I will go through um, the document. Uh, as if uh, nothing had uh, changed. Uh, okay. so as, if, as if it was a new document. So uh, basically what we say in the introduction is that tech coding is a reliable mechanism and we have to distinct and separate losses um, from so this mechanism, the tech coding mechanism has to be separated from the loss detection of the congestion controls. So there are some advantages in coding because when you have uh, tail losses or where you are in a network with huge and non-congestion losses, uh, tech can actually help. Uh, but the main drawback we see here is uh, coding could really high congestion signals. So this could lead to unfair comparison of tech coding mechanisms and uh, uh, points that do not consider congestion signals uh, in the um, capacity and the reduction so have to be fair. So this memo is an attempt to discuss how fake coding and congestion control exist. So we list how they can coexist. So and the main objective here is to encourage the research community to also consider congestion control aspects when proposing and cooperating comparing tech solution. Uh, we see too many people trying, uh, look how great my tech mechanism is, but really comparing with something that is just respecting fairness. So we were thinking there was something to be done here. Um, I may not have time to go through all the details here, but because I was not sure that my audio uh, would actually work. So I made a very wordy slide. Uh, so the figures on the right are the ones that you can find in the document at the moment. Uh, the main point I want to make is that basically we have two different channels. Um, one, uh, the FEC, the uh, condition control channel uh, carries packets and has some requirements. Um, and it reports a sending rate, sends out packets and collects information from the network. Uh, the FEC channel, on the other hand, um, has source packets, uh, a coding rate, and then source and or repair packets. 
um, we presented that as separated, but it's worth pointing out that they can be uh, within the same uh, transport, uh, within, within the same layer. So when we discussed that uh, among ourselves, water, uh, we thought it was a good uh, approach to actually separate the discussion whether the FEC is applied above or in or below the transport. So next slide, please. So now I will go through the different solutions we have in the document at the moment, which are uh, fake above transport, fake within transport, and fake below transport. For the fake above transport, um, the big advantage here is Basically, so the situation is described on the right, and for each case, is, that would be the case. I have a figure on the right showing what is going on. So basically, we have a FEC layer that has source packets as an input and has some way to measure um, uh, losses or repair packets on the other, from the other uh, endpoint. And it has some way to know. Uh, Coding rate that is also applied, and based on that, it's just sending source and or repair packets to the transport layer, and the transport layer takes network information and as an input and sends out source and or repair packets. So the good thing here in this solution is that we just don't have uh, congestion in a congested network. However, uh, if we have a congestion control that is reliable, um, there may be cases where may be bad interactions between the FEC and the transport. So in these cases, um, having a, a fully reliable data transfer is not really relevant. So GDP is a good example of a protocol that could be relevant in this support for the transport layer. If we go to the next slide, um, we have uh, FEC within transport. Um, the good thing here is that when you do that, you can actually uh, have an optimization uh, between both uh, channels. So you may be able to um, send a packet, repair packet that would not have congestion to congested network, but you could send redundant packets, repair packets, for example, when you have a space in your sending window but uh, no actual data to send. So there are lots of smart things that could be done here. Uh, and also, so that's one, uh, there are lots of advantages in this solution. However, when you do that, you may not have lots of gains as opposed to classical retransmission mechanism. You may end up sending repair packets when you actually have um, a limited bandwidth available. And so in this case, uh, the flooding ratio needs to be carefully designed, not to grab uh, a useless manner bandwidth, but also provide good end-to-end -end performance. And so the last case we have in the current version of the document is on the next slide. So this is fact below the transport, where basically you have a transport layer that is sending um, source packets. And underneath, we have an FEC channel. The good thing with that case is, is that basically we we can have very good performances when you have a lot of uh, persistent transmission losses. However, the, the problem here is that you may just end up adding congestion to a congestion network. So we have to be very careful on the cutting ratio we apply here. Um, so that is all we have at the moment in this version. So, uh, next slide, please. Um, for the moment, um, we, so if there are any questions, I will try to do my best now, and we would improve uh, the, this document by Madrid, hopefully. Uh, we welcome comments on the list, on the GitHub, anywhere. Uh, if you want to reach us and have a chat with us with what is not clear at the moment, we are available. Um, one thing is that the, that the current version of the document is very generic. Uh, the main point is, provide the research community a framework to when they can, uh, so that they can actually um, explain. Actually, uh, I have a question. Uh, yes. Um, this is uh, Chair Hadoff. 
Uh, you know, the issue of, of congestion control at FEC has been there since the beginning of people doing uh, FEC and network coding. So I think this is very important work. Um, do you guys intend to suggest a preferred approach or just to do a review? We, at the moment, we only focus on the server side. Um, I think what we need to do now next is to add the client um, point of view and a recommendation we want to do maybe is to say that everything needs to be decided on the server and the client must repair uh, um, um, advise all that has been repaired to the server. Um, so that is one of the recommendations we may want to do. Uh, apart from that, um, that's the if we do recommendation is let's try to be fair it, uh, i think we want to end up with more uh strong opinions that just describing uh, advantages and drawbacks we started with something very strong in terms of um what we um, maybe I, I can complete nicola I think we, we, we cannot pretend now that we are going to, to, to build the recommendation, Marie-Josée. Uh, th it's, it's, more, it's more a research work. We try to, fig to figure out what is the best approach. Uh, I think the document is not mature enough to be strong and to be sure of the best recommendation. So as I, mean, the, I, mean, I meant eventually. That's yeah, eventually, meant yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, and this is again now a question with my chair hat on. Um, this could be also something that we could do in collaboration with ICCRG. Uh, have you guys any intentions also uh, contacting Yana or the people of ICCRG about this? Uh, we we got Michael with us. With <laughs> I think he, <laughs> he's a good guy to help us, but uh, Michael. <laughs> Yes. Okay, uh, so in my opinion, the relationship between spec and congestion control is not as interesting as people maybe may have thought in the past. So my intention with uh, the, the contributions I made to this update of the document is to clarify a little bit how, where, the, where the boundary goes. Uh, there are some things that can be done that make sense uh, where there is a relationship, but some things like, for instance, putting back below the transport where I think is done a lot in satellite systems and in systems where it, where it makes sense. There are many cases where this kind of approach makes more sense. So I, I don't currently see what kind of interrelation with, with uh, ZCRG we would have. Can, I, I think the next step for the document would be to include references and start discussing some systems that exist and go a bit deeper into the pros and cons and discuss where in this categorization the different methods fit. But um, yeah, well, that, that's my view. I, I don't think the relationship is so deep that, that there is much interesting to be, to be done with the CRG right now. Okay, Michael, I have a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, when so my question was because uh, going back to the um, FEC for quick, you know, quick as its own uh, congestion control, and you know, there will be issues there about how we deal with that. But that's fine. Um, we can take it offline and on the list. Go ahead, Mesa. Yes, uh, uh, Michael. Uh, my question is uh, uh, about clarifying what. To what you meant by saying that relationship is not as interesting as one as what one may have thought. is it, do you mean that it's uh, so finally easy to fix to us to, to find a good compromise a good relationship is it a simple problem or, or what uh, I have problems understanding really what you mean um, no I I, I... I don't, I don't think that FEC is a simple problem. I don't think that congestion control is a simple problem. I do not yet see a very deep benefit of combining the two. I think it's 
uh, at least to begin with, it's more important to be clear of where the boundary goes and to keep them to, to explain, you know, where things should be separate to avoid mistakes that have happened in the past, right? Uh, like, it's like fixing a problem that congestion control, that tricks congestion control into believing that the packet was not lost and then misunderstanding things. I have seen some things on uh, where it was applied. There was some some work, and I I I I must admit I haven't really followed the recent quick things. But I remember there was some work at some point from from Google where they applied it only to repair losses on the uh, during the recovery phase. And if I um, remember it correctly, then the benefit of that was not huge. So I'm, what, what I'm saying is that I'm I'm not yet clear on, on whether combining those two together into into a mechanism uh, beneficial enough or interesting enough even to, to really have a deep collaboration here with ICCIG. I mean, the, the first step, in my opinion, is to is to classify the mechanism and discuss the benefits and pros and cons and see uh, how, how much leverage there is to combining the two. There may be some things, right, but I'm not sure if there is so much. I, yes, uh, to complete what said Michael, and to be clear, we are not arguing that uh, there is a possibility uh, that uh, combining congestion control and uh, neurasio coding scheme is, uh, is a good idea. Uh, we don't say that in the drafts, just analyzing the possibility of the combination and uh, the possibility to deploy over uh, in the upper layer or lower layer. That's it. Uh, we, we are uh, finally <laughs> to tell the truth, Michael and I, uh, we are not really convinced to deploy uh, an Erasure coding sim inside the transport layer. Maybe it should remain at the application or below. But we are not arguing that inside the, the, the draft. We are just discussing the impact on. Hmm, yeah, I, makes sense. Okay. Uh, you, Lars. You're on the you're on the queue. Yeah, let's see if this works better. Can you guys hear me? Perfect. All right, hallelujah. All right, so um, I might be naive, and I haven't looked at this in a long time, right? But I don't quite see how the two are related, right? So I can understand that you you want to use FEC or something else to um, repair from losses faster than a retransmission would would allow you to, right? So that that is pretty clear. But congestion control is all about um, what do you do with your send rate when a loss happened, right? In in order to um, not um, reduce your congestion window, um, if you detect a loss, you kind of need to know whether the loss was uh, congestion based or not. And and we don't, right? So, so uh, the the only sort of combination I would see is if you could somehow distinguish corruption losses or um, other non congestion losses from congestion losses. And then you could decide to like not react to the loss that you repaired. Or is there anything else that I'm missing? Uh, there, um, um, maybe uh, we are not talking about uh, uh, collaboration. We, we, we are between the congestion control and the RSU coding. We are talking about our interaction in terms of the cross-layer me uh, mechanism. We are talking about uh, uh, conjointly using both and uh, to see what is the impact on one to, to the other. So it means that, for instance, what is the impact of deploying uh, RSU coding tunnel so that the IP layer uh, when you are using a congestion control transport protocol. We are not saying that uh, there is cross layer to do or something like that. We are just... Yeah, what I, what I'm saying is, to... so let's assume you're putting FEC at the, at the IP layer, right? And, and so yeah. if there's a packet that gets lost, you repair it, and that loss is therefore not apparent to the transport, and the transport congestion controller doesn't reduce sequent. Exactly. Right? That is only a good idea if that loss was not due to congestion. Because if it was due to congestion, you wouldn't want to reduce sequin. That's what I'm getting at. We've had some discussion over decades and we don't know what the answer is. No, no, that, that's right. We, we definitely agree. That's what we want to point out. That's it. When we, we, 
also initiated these documents because we were discussing with Francois and there are so many researchers out there that compare um, a basic TCP solution with a TCP with network coding underneath and they say that they claim that their solution is the best because they just they just ignore congestion losses. So just as Michael said, we don't... Yeah, I, so I fully get that people like, mis, misstate what their researchers, right? Like Muriel did this a bunch of times, right? Saying like their TCP is better because, you know, it doesn't it doesn't drop the send rate. But it's all bullshit, right? Because you, and you, can, you, cannot, you cannot reduce the event even without doing FEC, right? It's, it's... So... We agree, Lars. We agree. We agree. It is just... We want... So if, if you claim that uh, your uh, FEC solution is great, just explain how you include that into uh, considering what, what congestion controls are doing, that you it allow, opens the room for uh, fake mechanisms that are not uh, unfair to be heard. That's something that could be done, but just such as Michael said, we need to go deeper into uh, to what extent uh, adding FEC in some uh, specific parts of um, the content control, such as uh, when you are um, um, requiring lost packets or when you are, um, uh, for example, when you have space in your sending window, you may just send a bunch of recovery packets to improve the performances for short files in case of tail losses. So these are the things that we want to be fairly compared with uh, the, the TCP and not just only ignoring congestion. I don't know if that was clear. Yes, I, I made a request to jump ahead to, ahead to answer Lars because Lars was asking <clears throat> whether there is something else uh, in terms of a relationship between congestion control and, and fact rather than this, this uh, basically the stupid thing of, of Misinterpreting loss, and uh, I would, well, what what I said is that it's not much, I believe, but some things do exist. Uh, I think that the measurements that congestion control carries out can be useful feedback for a fact scheme. Uh, like for instance, if you figure out that you have short loss, you imagine you have short flows, and you repeatedly have tail losses. And uh, it always gives you an RTO at the end. And for example, you could you could decide to add a uh, back at the end of the tail to compensate for that loss happening, or uh, you could switch to something like a dot add mode for certain packets only. Um, when when you send, you know, you want to you want to you don't you don't have anything else to send. Your, your rate is the application doesn't have much more to send, but then you may want to send. Uh, packets, for example, in a lead bed kind of style. Ideas like that. I'm just saying this is not huge stuff, but some ideas may exist. That's all I wanted to say. Okay. Is there any additional question, comments? There are several people in the queue, but I don't know what's the order anymore. I don't see the queue, so please, uh, Marie-Jo. Uh, yeah, you don't see the queue. That was Spencer, but I think, Spencer, you said you're fine to queue one. Francois, you had a comment. Uh, yes, so I just wanted to first say that uh, I agree that in the sense that it's unclear whether combining the two approaches would help much, but what we what we try to, to push here is more that um, we don't want to have interferences, like we don't necessarily want to combine, but we want the two mechanisms to like not, not interfere with each other and not hide the losses, like if you have quick, you, you can have uh, a, a delay-based congestion control or loss-based congestion control, but whether, uh, when, whatever the type of congestion control it is, uh, FEC should not have any inter interference. So if you have a loss and you recover it, that doesn't that doesn't change the fact that you had a loss. So you don't have to 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 hide the fact that you have a loss, and you have the quick uh, loss detection mechanisms that detects the loss, 
and then you can recover it or not. It doesn't change anything. The congestion control will adapt itself. But yeah, maybe the, the packet has been recovered, but it, it doesn't change the fact that the packet has been lost. And sometimes you can also recover packets without having any loss. If you have some reordering, then you will you may recover a packet and then you will finally receive it normally. So you will you will not notice a loss because the loss detection mechanism will like see that there was a reordering and then that's fine. But I mean we just want to like separate the two mechanisms. So not necessarily combine themselves, but make them separate and not interfere with each other. That's just what I wanted to say. Oops, I put my video. Uh, also in the in the list that was um, Colin, do you still have a question? I didn't have a question. I was just going to follow up a little bit on Lars and Michael. Um, I think uh, some, some of the other areas where the, the combination of congestion control and coding might be relevant. Um, if if we have enough ECN deployment, then it perhaps becomes possible to distinguish between congestive and non-congestive losses, which uh, could change uh, whether this is interesting in some cases. Uh, and I think even without that, um, there, there's potentially something interesting to be said about uh, using congestion control signals to change the balance between um, coding data and original data. Um, I don't know how, how much depth there is here, but I think you know, there's not nothing in the relationship. Don't have anything to say? Or do you, was your question answered? I'm sorry, who were you talking to? Sir, I'm talking to you. You were on the queue. Yes, right. Um, so I dropped out and then dropped back in. Uh, I just wanted to, to say that I think that uh, Michael's uh, point about uh, the classification work uh, and categorization work uh, here was really important, uh, no matter where this goes, uh, because we can't, you know, the only reason we didn't have people trying to do this again in the ITF uh, at, at uh, 107 was because we canceled most of the meetings where that would have happened. Uh, but I mean, th this stuff keeps coming back up. So uh, I think I think that this is I, I think that the categorization work is really important uh, for both the ITF and the IRTF. Thank you. Thank you. I don't think there's any anybody else in the list. If there is other questions, can uh, somebody raise their hands or just, you know, just, um, drop in? Okay. Uh, so I guess um, we're getting eight minutes over time that we were supposed to do, but I'm okay with that. Um, so uh, if people have other things to attend, um please do uh this thing doesn't uh will not shut down anyway so uh i guess we're at the anyway we're at the conclusion now uh thanks do you have a, a a slide for for the conclusion or you want to conclude or you let me conclude okay no thanks no sorry i i, I was muted uh, yes uh, please please might as well do conclude Thank you. Um, so I think, it, uh, you know, I like short meetings. Um, so thank you everyone um, for, for dialing in or living with WebEx. I agree with Lars, I have issues with WebEx and especially, uh, again, the lack of a queue for questions. So if you don't, and actually in my version, I don't know which version I have, I don't see the whole chat. I see just like I have to scroll through the chat. Uh, to see it, and I don't see the the window very well, so I think the queue management is is for questions is not the best. But anyway, uh, like I said, this is the new normal. So um, thank you, everyone. Uh, I think we can continue a lot of the discussions uh, on the list, and um, yeah, I think we we raised the two issues that were uh, 
the ones for this month, I would say, which was the congestion control and, and the IPR policy. Um, and we'll be following uh, both uh, very carefully. And again, for uh, as a personal note, uh, for the people after the Saturday uh, email requesting that I would step down, uh, I really appreciate all the people who sent uh, messages to the list and who sent a personal message to me. Um, it was really uh, appreciated and, um, you know, it made, I think, uh, you know, the work that I do for this uh, even more worthwhile. And I really, really thank you. Thank everyone for having done it. Um, in these hard times, uh, I will let you guys go back to your uh, quarantines or to your confinements or shipwrecking. Uh, and uh, we'll convey very soon and hopefully uh, very soon we'll be able to meet real people and not just uh, avatars on the on the Internet. Thank you, everyone. Yes, thank you, Marie Jose. Thank you, everyone, for this participation. Thank you all. See you next time. Bye. Goodbye. Bye. 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 Bye.